Hey, what's going on, everybody? It is your boy, Angel R. Talk, with Not Just NYC Talking. The city of New York, Boricua from the Bronx. <laughs> and I am joined today by someone who is running for New York City Council. Evan, I am not, I, I mean, I kind of feel like I could just say Bocardi. Is that right? Yeah. Bocardi. Bo Bocardi, <laughs> like like just well you know, you know a lot of people enjoy our fine products uh, <laughs> no no i wish i had rum money but i don't <laughs> oh my goodness you could oh, really make God. some change then you could really impact and change the world oh my with God. that book I, I, listen if i had the rum money i just <laughs> donate to whatever we needed in the neighborhood you know uh, <laughs> So, but, so you're it's running for but a dream, but a dream. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Maybe you're a relative and you don't even know it yet. You know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so you're running for council, and you you just said something that just triggered a memory as I was reading up on what what you stand for and what you were saying. You, I mean, I'm sorry to jump into this one thing real quick, but you just said you donate money. Um, if you were, you know, Bacardi and stuff. One of the things I saw was that you would be willing to donate a portion of your salary if you were in in office. Now that kind of stood out to me because I was like, really? Share, tell, tell us who you are, what you do, and, and if you want to touch on that, because that was very interesting and something that not most people would do, well, I think. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I just think that most people would, you know, not do it, unless you're, I guess, someone like Trump who's trying to do it for, in my mind, not other than uh, honorable reasons, but let's not go there. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, jeez, Louise. Look, once I go there, I'll, I'll talk to you for four hours. You'll never get out of here. Uh, but uh, no. So my name for people who don't know me, my name's Evan Bacardi, and uh, I'm, I guess, your average guy. I'm a fourth generation New Yorker. I live here in Forest Hills. Um, I'm originally from Bayside. I've lived all over in my life, um, and I'm doing, I'm running for city council because I don't care really about the money or the power. I consider it to be a civic duty, um, and I, I feel that the money, I can live comfortably on less than what's allocated to a New York City council member, um, and of course, everyone always wants more money. Of course, but I, I, I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it because I want to see real change. I want to see our city be vibrant and our neighborhood and our community be vibrant. Um, and if I can say, take 15% uh, out of my salary and donate it to like a nearby park or a playground or a school that needs whatever I, I i'm happy to do that um you know because i it's not really about money it's about ideas and it's about the people so no i i never wanted to take the full salary um and uh that's that's why i'm doing it. that's why i'm running really is it, it's a change a change is necessary and i don't need additional monies in my life uh, to do that. I'm, I'm quite comfortable here. I've got my two bedroom and uh, I can fix most anything in it. So I, I'm quite happy with my setup. Yeah, well, that's good. I, I mean, that's generous of you. And, and, and it's, it's, it's refreshing in, in this world because I, I mean, I come from, I mean, poverty, right? We were poor and, and, and I'm, I'm living, I have home, I'm comfortable, but, you know, I'm certainly not wealthy and um, I, you know, I could sure use a surplus of, of funds to pay off debt and pay off, you know, so I think most people think that way so that, that uh, a person can say, you know, I'm willing to do this and you can still, you know, you're, you're comfortable with that. Like, you know, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's rare, you know, um, so you know, that's a nice thing. Um, certainly could use it for the schools. I mean, I know a lot of teachers who pay out of pocket. Um, yeah, I, I know one very, very close to me. My wife's actually a biology teacher. So, okay. she, so she's done a lot out of pocket. Uh, she's, I believe her 
fourth year teaching now. So she she's done a number of things that you know. Yeah, which I find that it's mind blowing that teachers have to. Uh, for, it's not like they're making a huge salary to begin with, a, a huge amount of money, right? Let, you know, and they're in a job that is, in my mind, a job of uh, improving society and making things better. You're educating the future, the future generation, the future leaders, the, and that they have to, out of their own, you know, out of their own finances, fund you know, to get, to get materials for the classes and stuff that that's always troubled me. And I, I initially couldn't even believe it. Like I was like, really like, like, Oh yeah, Angel, I have to, I pay for these things. And, and I had a, in fact, I know about this because they would create uh, fundraisers on Facebook, um, go fund me and stuff. We're trying to raise uh, so that I can get these materials for the students. And I was just uh, kind of uh, mind blown that that was the case, you know, so that I'm sure they'll welcome that. Even if you give it directly, like if you form some sort of a charity or something that teachers can, actual teachers like on the ground can draw fun and, you know, like to, to help them out, you know, cause that is, you know, I, my fear with, with donating is that sometimes the people who you're donating to never even get the help. Right, that happens a lot of times. And it's amazing that um... There, I mean, mo most people don't do this, but uh, I, course, I advise course. anybody who's donating to any charity to go online first and research the, the, the charity fully because sometimes uh, these non-profits, non -profits, the, uh, the CEOs make a fortune. Mm. Um, and <laughs> it's like, well, you're, you're trying to get as much money to people who need it as possible. And uh, of course, you want to attract good talents for your nonprofit. But uh, if you're making over a million bucks a year, that doesn't really seem that there's no profit. I mean, it's certainly profitable for you, is it not? Uh, so what is, you know, what, are, what exactly is your contribution to justify taking that level of money and giving it to a person? You know, if, you know, I, I mean, if that person being there and giving them a million dollar salary generates... Twenty million dollars towards the people who need it, then I would kind of be like, okay, then you're making an investment to generate. But if it's just a, a outward payment that doesn't, you know, return, then I don't, I don't know about that. You know, I think it was J.P. Morgan who said that the top salary of the highest paid employee at any company should never be more than a twenty to one ratio to the lowest paid person at any company. JP Morgan said that very well to wow. God. Yeah. And I think the ratio of CEO to worker pay is like over 500 to one nowadays in some companies. So it's it's gotten a little ridiculous, wouldn't you? It's a little off. It's a little, <laughs> we're a little off on that uh, JP Morgan ratio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because he was such a generous guy, you know, really down to earth, JP Morgan. To say that it's 20 to 1 ratio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? We're 500 to 1. I'd say that's. Uh, it's know. kind of a little ridiculous. Oh, my God. So we met at an event. I actually got there a little late, which I I wish I'd gotten there earlier. Um, well, but it was at an event protesting. Um, or I don't know if we can call it a protest, a rally of sorts to, to um, uh, talk about this a hotel we have in Kew Gardens which has become somewhat, we'll say, troublesome. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that, uh, you know, on, on what's going on there? And I, I will say this, um, I feel like whoever is involved is, there is someone listening because I have seen police vehicles posted. I came out yesterday and I saw four officers standing almost like in a tactical position. It was, it was bizarre. I, I, I went over, as a matter of fact, when we met, I was talking with two of them, two of them were there. And I asked them like, should I be running? I, I mean, cause it looked like they were, they're like, no, it's, we're just presence, but it was a show of force. So someone is doing something. I, and I don't, you know, you probably have more insight to that than I do, but simply seeing them there at least says to me, okay, something's going down. So you want to uh, uh, share, share, um, 
Well, you know, Angel, this situation with the, um, for the, the listeners who are unfamiliar with it, basically we've had a, um, a hotel went up in Kew Gardens. Uh, I think the construction was planned in 2008, 2009, and was finally finished about uh, three or four years ago. And so basically since when the hotel first opened, it was a typical hotel, it's passed, it's changed hands multiple times at this point. Um, and basically it became a hotel housing homeless men. Um, people objected to that in our neighborhood and it was replaced with homeless families and everything seemed to be fine or at least significantly improved for a while. Uh, and now with COVID, uh, you know, obviously they're just really letting uh, anybody in and it's become a real issue. Um, you know, obviously I'm not against, I, I'm not for homeless people being on the street or anything like that, but when it comes to be a severe disruption in quality of life and their shootings and their drug dealings and shootings, like that, shootings kind of, it's kind of where we draw the line. You know, yeah, I think a shooting is kind of, a, it's, it's kind of when you got to say, huh. you know, yeah. I, I, you know, when the shooting started is when I, <laughs> I kind of, you know, like, at that point, oh. I say, I, I, well, I was no longer, it's like you just said, um, we want to help people. We want people to have help. And, and um, it, it, the question then becomes, well, where do you put people? And if there's places to put them, I, I get it. You know, like we want to be good people. We want to be good neighbors. We want to good humans. You know, we want to help people. Right. So it, it, it's hard for me to, 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 uh, What's the word I'm thinking of to, you know, not that cognitive dissonance between those two ideas, you know, like it, it, uh, reconciliate or just to, right. to kind of, you know, to say, okay, I want to help, but wait a minute in helping you now, I have to dodge bullets. What, what changed here? Yeah. What happened? Why, why is all of a sudden w w it's, it's been like this. F well, we've had um, people there for some time that, that were receiving help and it was okay. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I, I'd say when COVID hit, when COVID hit is when I noticed the bigger change. Uh, and that's when all of a sudden things got real crazy. And of course, to the point where we've had now two shootings. I've had um, um, scuffles with people down there that, that took issue with me walking on the sidewalk. Wow, you know? Really? You know? Yeah, I, I, I had words. It was about, it was five guys. Um, <laughs> five guys a woman and an infant. And I was just walking through the sidewalk with my wife and my wife tried to pull me into the road, to the street, you know, towards the road to avoid the crowd. And I guess the Bronx in me kind of came out and I alphaed up. And I was like, I'm not going into the street because these guys think they own the sidewalk. Right. And I, I just kept walking. I didn't do anything aggressive. I just walked. but. In walking, I think they perceived that as, oh, yeah, you know, and I, I see the infant. It's a cute baby. Mm -hmm. So I turn and I see one of the guys staring at me. And I say, you know, this is a cute baby. And then he kind of steps forward and staring at me. He's me mugging me. And at that point, I see the other four guys staring at me. And I'm thinking to myself, this was a bad idea. I just, I just, you know, I just made a mistake more so because I was with my wife. I just exposed her to danger. Right. Um, if this escalates, you know, and, and, and I regretted it at that moment when I, I see, I'm like, oh crap, I just, you know, if it's me alone, whatever, but I was with my wife and I, I just got in the moment, the, the Bronx in me that says, you know, if you, if you go into the street, they're going to think you're weak and they're going to forever mark you as a target. You know, that whole dynamic yeah. just going through my head. And um, one of the guys said, yo, my man. And he calls to me and I, Again, I'm in alpha mode and I went over and I'm like, what's up, brother? You know, and he's like, yo, uh, next time walk around and he points to the road, which is where my wife was trying to pull me to. And I was like, well, what about the vehicles? He's like, next time walk around. I like, can't do that. And uh, I looked at the guys like, we're good. We're all good here. You know, just and uh, he's like, yeah, we're good. And I walked away. But right. the fact that I had to do that. Yeah. You know, I have one guy threw something at me one time when I was walking. They were sitting in front of the uh, pasta, what well, used to be the pasta lovers. Right. Like four or five guys were drinking there. And um, 
oh, yeah, sitting on the steps, chilling, drinking. Uh -huh. And I walked by and I just glanced in and uh, he threw something at me. And uh, see, at that time I had my wits and I just thought to myself, nah, let me not. <laughs> and I just, I just looked at him, I nodded and I kept walking, you know, but the fact that I'm having to take that mindset in this quiet neighborhood because of, you know, what's going on, it's troubling to me. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's you, crazy. You know, it is New York and I understand that things happen, but we never had to deal with this kind of stuff. So the question then becomes what changed after COVID? Something changed. Now, I don't know exactly what it is. I read that uh, it's that they're renting the, the rooms for parties and stuff. I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if there's people living there, if they're, if they're just hotel patrons, like, I don't know, but you know, um, which, which, which I'm, I'm, I, I got something I'm going to read. Cause you, I read something about you and de Blasio, right? You were vocal about your thoughts on de Blasio, which I find interesting because I would imagine that as you're trying to get into the position, you would just kind of just lay in the cut, you know, and not, you know, but you were very vocal about your thoughts on de Blasio. Yes, because I, I, <laughs> I, try, well, I, I try to be a rare thing, an honest politician. I, uh, I don't think de Blasio is uh, competent at uh, most things he does. Um, wow. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to say it, and I don't care if he dislikes me or if anyone else dislikes me for that opinion. But uh, this, this is, um, I mean, it, it almost seems like he has a superhuman ability to know what everybody wants and everybody needs and just do the opposite. <laughs> and uh, it's like, it, it seems whenever I have, it, it's okay, like whenever I have an opinion, or well, most people have, and I, I think I have the opinion of many people in my neighborhood, but whenever I have an opinion about something, he seems to always want the opposite. It, it's really extraordinary how little of a pulse he's got on the issues and what, what people want and what people need. Um, and. Uh, I, I could see it if maybe you came from Alaska and you were mayor here, but you've lived in the city for 20 plus years. I mean, how, how could you know so little about what's going on around you? I mean, I, I was really just surprised. Um, I voted for de Blasio the first time, and I actually wrote in someone else uh, the second time. I wrote in Daffy Duck because I thought he was even more qualified uh, to be... Uh, a mayor, a uh, mayor of New York City. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's my opinion of uh, Bill de Blasio. So, okay. So we, we've we established that and I concur. I, I never even heard of the guy until he got elected and I never liked the guy ever since he got elected. I'm not a fan. I don't, I don't know. I just, well, it'll all tie in right now. So I'm going to say some names, right? I got Koch, Dinkins, Giuliani, Bloomberg, de Blasio. Right. We, we spoke on email um, during Koch and Dinkings was the 80s and the 90s. In my opinion, New York City was that was the, you know, peep shows in Times Squares. That was when everything was crazy. Right. right. Now, I was too young at the time to to understand or perceive. But one thing I noticed and, and you may have researched this more or have some more clarity and this is why I mentioned all these names right when Giuliani came into office right I feel like everything changed I feel like New York City changed now Giuliani is crazy now I you know the guy's That's off right. his rocker and he may have been then I don't know I was too young I I wasn't involved in any politics I, and it's not like I know a lot now but at that time I didn't know anything I wasn't involved in anything the one thing I can say honestly, and, and people don't like it when I say it sometimes because they think that I'm um, uh, advocating for policies that hurt us Latinos and minorities and stuff, which isn't the case. All I can say is that when I was a teenager, um, during the time of Koch and Dinkins, the streets were wild. Giuliani came in, now things changed. I. I I don't know what he did right, what he did wrong. You know, like, like I, I, I don't have all the specific details. I mean, whenever I've mentioned that, I've had people share information with me about how he was targeting people and, and uh, unjustly jailing people and, and just blanket. So that may be true. I, I, I don't know enough about it to honestly um, share on that. But what I can say is I felt the streets change. 
I no longer saw people with their beads out, their gang beads, right? I didn't see the gangs in the corner. I didn't, things changed. Um, I don't know, again, I, I'm not trying to justify any crazy right wing behavior or whatever. I'm just speaking as a person who walked the street. I noticed things were different. Um, Bloomberg came along and they stayed okay. You know, um, he, he also did some things that, that uh, you know, stop and frisk was still around. And, and, and you know, there were some things that, you know, I, I actually uh, spoke against, but things stayed okay in terms of just walking the streets, just your everyday walking. And then once we got the Blasio, I feel like things started to change. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about just a person walking the street, right? Um, and I'm measuring my words as carefully as I can because, I, you know, I, 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 I have seen things that were bad and, you know, I, I encountered issues in the street myself. And, um, but I, I, is that, is that a fair statement? You know, like, like you're, you're not that, well, you're younger than I am, but you mentioned you were around. I think I told you the story of my dad. Um, okay. When they uh, busted my, um, some crazy guy came with yes, a yes. He busted all the windows at my okay. grandparents' place because he got the address wrong. He wanted to, to mm. kill the people my store. And uh, basically, they, uh, they had to arrest him. And uh, the okay. family apologized I... to my grandfather. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, that was frightening. But uh, yeah, so, you know, I'll tell you a story real quick. They attack, so they're sitting at home. All of a sudden, someone starts bashing in the windows. They run to the bathroom. And for some reason, instead of calling the cops, they call my aunt and my uncle who live like three or four blocks away. And so my aunt, this is my great aunt, my grand, my great aunt and grand uncle. Um, so they say, oh my God, Kathy and Frank are being attacked. We gotta get over there. So they drive over there, they hop out of the van, they look through the window, they see my aunt and my uncle ready to defend them with the quickest things that they could grab. The weapons that they chose were a paint roller and a hairbrush. Oh Stop the guy with the bat. And uh, they saw the guy with the bat and they got back in the van and drove away. Oh my god. So oh. Uh, but yeah, things were not great. Back then, my grandfather's car got stolen twice. Even in Bayside growing up, they broke into my mother's car twice, took the stereo. Um, you know, things definitely changed. And look, you know, crime is still, crime is still down significantly. Like right now, uh, overall crime is, is still at pretty low levels. The shootings are the main concern right now. The, the uptick in violent crime is, is the, the, the shocking issue and uh, almost confusing. Now it's a really unusual year. This could just be a fluke. Um, mm. But if you said that this is a fluke, let's just wait it out. I'm sure people wouldn't be satisfied with that. Um, right. You know, I, I'm not satisfied with that. If I had a shooting across the street from me uh, in Kew Gardens at this hotel, I, I would have major issues with it. Um, it's kind of funny because when I was growing up, I was taught that um, broken windows theory. Um, what, you're familiar with broken windows theory, you know. Just, you, you mind just briefly yeah, explaining that? Explain it. Basically, it's the concept that um, small crimes and disorders sort of lead to, are sort of a gateway to larger problems. Um, you know, if you have people it's almost a psychological concept. You know, basically if you're walking through a neighborhood and there's one broken window, then you're like, well, no one really cares about this place. This guy broke this window and, and there's, there's no consequence. So, I mean, Hey, it's an abandoned factory. I'll go a rock through a window until all the windows are eventually broken. Meaning that cast crime can cascade the theory says, um, when smaller issues aren't addressed. Now, hmm. People have since said that broken windows theory is disproven. And I tend to, when not trained in criminology, I would tend to agree with the experts. Um, but I, I argue that broken windows theory perhaps doesn't mean anything for crime, but it certainly means things. It, it does have consequences in our real estate market, the quality of life of our neighborhoods, okay? 
if you get on the subway and you ride the seven train now, you'll likely find one that's had its windows smashed in by some. You've read that in the news. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. yes, that is some. So <laughs> some random guy is getting on the flushing line and smashing the windows, and the MTA is actually running out of windows. He's done three hundred thousand dollars worth of damage. They understand that if you have a broken window, that will show you don't care, and so they are replacing the windows. But actually, they they start to run out. Uh, of all those spare parts. So basically, someone riding the subway and seeing that all the windows are broken in the subway car gets the impression like crime is up. This is an issue. I need to get out of here. So I read an article in the New York Times just saying that there's this huge demand of people running for the suburbs right now. So, okay. <laughs> Broken windows theory perhaps is not a concept that makes sense in criminology anymore. Maybe it never did. Um, I don't have the numbers to back it up, and I, I'm not going to pretend that I know the fine my new details of the criminal justice. Um, but I certainly understand the broader strokes that people, when crime goes up, people are afraid, and they leave a neighborhood. And if they leave a neighborhood and the vacancy rate goes up and landlords can't afford to fix buildings or do this or upgrade or that, then it, it gets disused and it goes down in value and the neighborhood gets worse. Um, mm. You know, you want to create good, safe housing that people can enjoy, amenities that people can enjoy. And, and top, the most important thing is that people feel safe. Um, before, for anything else, I mean, if you look at the, um, what's that concept of... Uh, you you need to achieve your food needs, your water needs. Mas Maslow's hierarchy yes, of needs. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. See, my wife teaches psychology as well. I should have known that. You know, don't know. <laughs> Our secret. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, the hierarchy of needs. So you know, at first, people need to feel that safety. Need to have that shelter. Need to have those. Those needs need to come first. Um, and and if you don't have those basic needs and people will get afraid and then move away. Now, what's unique is in New York, you know, unlike most of the country, I think the country has, as a whole, has a two to one ratio, like two thirds of the country own their houses and one third rents. In New York City, it's actually the reverse. Most people don't own their houses, they rent. Mm -hmm. So if they don't, if the, the neighborhood gets really bad, Exactly. They don't have to sell. <laughs> they, right. they don't have to worry about putting things on the market or rent or fees. They're like, listen, let's get out of here, <laughs> yeah, and, we're out of here. as quick as possible. And that's the problem. Uh, okay. Because <laughs> most, a, a lot of people care about their neighborhood. They've been living there for a long time. There's, their kids grew up there. Their neighbors are there. Their friends are there. So they have more of an attachment to a place than just, you know, what their address is. Okay, but the truth of the matter is, it's also going to be a huge chunk of people who say, "I can, I don't, I can afford a house in Long Island. I don't care about the taxes, and I don't need this. I'm out of here." And that's when we lose a tax base. That's when we start losing money for services and programs that help people. That's that starts a chain reaction of mental anguish that cascades through society. Um, you know, it, it's really funny to me, um, you know, why the city has certain policies that it does that, you know, are inherently not in the city's interest. We had for a long time, and my family benefited from this, um, they own uh, a Mitchell Lama apartment. And for those unfamiliar, Mitchell Lama was a program named after, I believe, two state senators who, or state legislatures, I think one was in the state legislature and one was in the state senate in Albany and they came up with this program that you know basically is low equity housing like you my family for instance um lived on the Lower East Side my mother's from the Lower East Side and then she moved to Lindenwood and Middle Village and Forest Hills and Bayside eventually but um my family remained in the Lower East Side and they lived in a two-room apartment their whole lives and eventually they got a two-bedroom with a terrace in Mitchell Lama in the Mitchell Lama building, um, it called the Village View Complex on First Avenue in Manhattan. Maybe you're familiar with it, um, but it's between Avenue A and First Avenue in Manhattan. 
and they paid three thousand dollars for the shares to be in that building. And when <laughs> my relatives, actually, this one remains a relative, is done with it, and you know, she decides, well, I'm tired. I want to move to Florida, or I want. Though I wouldn't recommend that now. Uh, <laughs> Or I'm tired and I want to move to Florida or I'm getting married and, and he's got a house in Staten Island and I'm going to move in with him. That goes, that housing, which is hers, she owns the <laughs> shares in the co-op, goes back on the market for a, another reasonable price. Um, it, she didn't make profit on it. I see. Okay? There was no, there's not like. That was what I was just thinking right now. Like, holy crap, they are going to be well off on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But it, the brilliance of the program is you do own your apartment. You own the shares, but it's, you come in at a low level, so it's affordable. And that's why for Mitchell Llamas, you know, the wait lists on them can be, you know, years. Um, mm -hmm. Co-op City is the best known example of Mitchell Llama apartments. Okay. You know, people. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge, huge complex. So the wait list is a little better there. And that's a little, obviously, further out. You have to take the bus to the subway. But that's yes. that's that's well-known example. And look, people own the apartments. I make the argument that people who own, okay, have more inherent interest. Most people aren't like this. People care about their neighborhood, wherever they live. But they have more inherent interest in saying, well, I can't sell right now. So I have to take action to try to save this place. Um, right. Whereas some people who are inherently disinterested, like, oh, I lived in New York City for a while. I, and, you know, I think I'm going to move back to Austin. And, you know. Transplants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I've seen a few that, people well, do it. doesn't help us who are behind. Because <laughs> you're going back to Austin, but we'll live here forever. So yeah. that's, that's, that's the issue. Um, I hope I have answered your question because I went off. Couple different ways there. Oh, I we, tend to do that, you know. I, I have lots of things. We hopped all over. Now <laughs> I have I have uh, another one that that is also something that you spoke about, and um, it's 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 uh, of huge interest. And I I as I was reading, I had formulated a question I wanted to ask you about it, but you actually answered it in the later portion. So I'm going to bring that up. Right, you were talking about the Rikers Island closure right. um, and they want to put the borough jails. And when you said uh, this can be used for other things, but you actually mentioned something about affordable housing, veterans, right. elderly, disabled, which is actually a really good idea, yeah. right, which makes, makes great sense. So should we really be worried about that jail in terms of safety and what will happen? Like I, I was told by a real estate uh, agent when I, I was asking one of my friends, you know, should I sell? Should I get the hell out of here? You know, he's like, uh, you should be more worried about the hotel than the jail. Oh, yeah. You know, um, this is what the guy told me because he's the hotel can be made into shelters and they tend to attract shootings and more type of problems. Whereas the jail, they're in jail. <laughs> you know, So yeah. what, what are your thoughts on that like is it something that we really should i mean i i don't want it there obviously and i agree with you and and many other people um you don't by taking a, a group of people and moving them to a new building you haven't changed anything precisely okay so, this is a multi-pronged <laughs> question okay so maybe i should so um multiple multiple fronts there okay so First off, I don't think putting a jail in a community inherently makes that community less safe. You probably aren't going to have a lot of gangsters and people hanging around a prison. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense because there's a lot of police activity. You're, you're not going to see them hang around a jail, most, more than likely, okay? Maybe they're, they're, they got out and they're leaving, but they want to get as far away from there as possible. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't think that that's a huge concern. I mean, the Kew Garden top of detention was there years ago. Um, smaller, but there, and it still stands. Um, actually, it was used for oranges, the new black filming a few times. It's amazing. Oh. Um, most, most people don't know that. Um, my, my grander issue, and I think that um, the people in my neighborhood uh, feel that the, the bigger issue uh, 
is you're spending $10 billion on the show. The concept behind, the, the, the initial concept behind this was that if you break up Rikers, you'll have these smaller community jails people couldn't go to. It's easier to get to under the guise that this is more fair. Um, okay. The commission, first off, the commission that, that looked into this, okay, I forget the name of the commission, Lipman Commission, um, the commission that looked into this said that they want community-based jails. So not one per borough, but like several spread out through, throughout the neighborhoods and boroughs, and these would be a few stories high here and there, not too far from precincts, close enough to court offices, that kind of thing. Because that was politically unpalatable, they said, well, if we make them into a larger building centralized in each borough, um, then people will care. The, the people directly around it will object to it, but most of the people in the borough will not care. So we can get it passed. Um, so basically, that's, that's more or less what happened. It actually, the point of the, what's going on with these jails, what they purport is the point, is not even being achieved with this current plan. Um, so, <laughs> It's just so fine, like when you're building. So basically, they want to spend ten billion dollars on that instead of spending the money on, say, education and recidivism programs that would keep people out of jail in the first place, okay? Or keep people out of jail who've been in jail, okay? Retraining, jobs, affordable housing, get you on your feet. That's much more valuable than Mets tickets, by the way. Okay, so, sorry if you're a Mets fan, but uh, <laughs> but. Uh, um, but the point is I'm that the Bronx, so <laughs> Yankees. I didn't think you were. I didn't think you were. But uh, I just wanted to double check. But um, but no, um, you gotta love your bombers, right? So Bronx. Bronx I, I, I I tell you, I don't even watch baseball. I have I I never I went to one game in my life, and I left by the third inning. I was so bored. It just doesn't interest me. But if I had to pick a team. Of course. I go with the Yankees. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh my God. Well, anyway, I'm getting I'm getting off my point again. But so basically, the the concept that they need these jails, they also purport like, okay, it's gonna break up that culture. They're doing bad stuff at Rikers and things like that. You're not doing anything by breaking up the cult by breaking up the 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 structure of Rikers and separating the guards, okay, and putting them in different areas, okay. That is not going to solve the problem, guy. I mean that that's so asinine and ludicrous. I don't know even where to start with that, okay. First off, if you can open a look back window for um, the Catholic Church and Boy Scouts of America, of which I was a member of both, surprisingly, but you know. Uh, then you should open a look back window for the prison guards who are committing human rights abuses, okay, right. and and bring them to justice because really the prisoners by the time they got out of jail and say, hey, officer so and so did this to me, they're gonna say, well, the statute of limitations is up on that. You should have said something. And you're like, how could I say anything? I was in jail, and so it's so ludicrous. So they're gonna break. The, the guards up and they're going to separate them into four different locations, that's going to do nothing, okay? That's not going to change the culture that's there. That's not going to solve the problem. Changing the physical location of the buildings is not going to help right. people the way it how does that, is. How does that, doesn't make any sense. I, I read an article, um, Earl Lewis sent me an article. He was making the case for it, I believe. I'll have to double check on that. I don't quite remember. It was a long time ago. But he, he sent me an article saying, Angel, this is one of the reasons it makes sense. And I read it and it was like, okay, I kind of get it. But at the same time, the bottom line is, hey, look, if, if, if I want to punch someone in the face and you change my shirt, I still want to punch them in the face. Yeah. Not, you didn't change anything. But if you sit me down and you talk to me and you say, hey, Angel, you know, you don't want to punch that guy in the face because uh, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and you might end up in a bad place. And 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 have a conversation with the guy, and we talk. Then I don't want to punch him in the face anymore. But just changing my sweater, or maybe putting me in a different bedroom, or or putting me in a different block, it doesn't change anything. So yeah. I I thought that that 
that was weird because it, the the I, I I don't see the benefit in it. You know, I don't see the benefit in inconveniencing the neighborhood um, with this thing. That if if okay if this was gonna be something that really uh, made reform. If it really said that, okay, New York is going to be safer. These guys that are in jail are gonna are gonna come out and they're gonna get careers and they're gonna be different people. Wow. These COs are gonna are gonna are gonna stop abusing them. Not all of them. Let's be clear. We're not wow. bashing any law enforcement here. You know, they're gonna change. The bad apples are gonna change by this move. Then I'm with it. I'm with it because then wow. I can see a greater uh, benefit to society as a whole. But I don't hear anything in this move that uh, achieves that. Exactly, because it's politically unpalatable to say that. Well, we're not going. We're not going to take this anymore, and we have to start looking into these abuses by these guards. It's politically unpalatable for a politician to say that because people generally don't care about the prison population. Okay, they don't care about the people in jail. They feel like okay, they're in jail. You, you earned your way here. If there's you something. Know. Right. That happening to them seems like just desserts, except the right. fact that they may be innocent. Um, right. So right. that's that's an issue, wouldn't you say? Um, yeah. This is, is something too. I've I've learned as I gotten older. Um, I I was very, you know, speaking, you know, frankly, I was very also kind of one of those people that would say, "Well, you shouldn't have gotten yourself locked up. Hey, it's on you." You know, and when I was younger, because. I was a victim of a lot of crime. You know, I grew up in the Bronx. And as I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of crime and a lot of gangs. And I, I had a lot of abuse inflicted upon me. So when those individuals were locked up, to me, it was like, man, yeah, I don't care. You know, you know, you get what you deserve. You know, um, as I've gotten older, I've, I've learned that a lot of the individuals who are in jail uh, oh my God! I can't remember the name. This gentleman, the one who came out from Rikers and killed himself, he had You know, there's a lot of people who, who didn't do anything, who are, who are, who are, are just being held until a trial or until, and uh, and what happens in in jail and prison? It actually makes you. You know, it's like we were talking about when I was walking through the block. I had to shift into this mode, where you're going to be in that mode all the time in jail. You might be a good guy, but you don't want to get beat up. You don't want them to take your milk, you know. So it makes you into a, a criminal, so to speak, just to survive. Yeah. When you didn't even deserve to be there. So, you know, I don't hear anything about that being addressed in moving the location. Right. Do you hear anybody talking about, hey, look at this guy whose right to a speedy trial was violated, who was away for years for nothing? Did you... <laughs> So, no, exactly. You know, and actually my, um, it's funny that we this comes around in circle. That same uh, part of my family uh, who lived in the Mitchell-Lama apartment, he was a uh, CEO for many years on Rikers Island. Uh, oh. And later on, he actually became a Secret Service agent and guarded Reagan, I believe. But, oh. uh, so, it's kind of funny how that worked out. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, I digress. You know, it, there are so many things wrong with this plan, and it's so extraordinary that, like, I don't even know what to begin with it. But like you say, I think that the money would be better spent on affordable housing, our seniors, our vets, the disabled, people who really, really need it. And it actually would be a boon for the neighborhood here, okay? Grandma's got a three-bedroom here uh, in, in um, let's say, the Pinnacle Building. Grandma's got a three-bedroom. Everyone's moved out, okay? So she doesn't want to give up the place. She's been there many years. But there's people who need three-bedroom apartments who have children. And three-bedroom apartments are the hardest to find in New York mm -hmm. City. That's why the jump between two bedrooms and three bedrooms is so huge, even though it's one extra room, because it's really hard to find the three-bedroom apartment. Um, so... If we had affordable housing that was geared towards seniors who've been in our community for a long time and want to still walk the same streets that they've always walked and, and the same places that they've always been. I have a woman in my, um, my building in the protective privacy, I won't use her name, but she's a, uh, 
She came over when she was a young child. Her family survived the, uh, the Holocaust. And uh, she's lived in my building since she was a child, and she never left. Uh, she's a great woman, very much an inspiration to me personally for different reasons. Um, but there's people who just don't want to leave. These are the streets they grew up on. These are the places they know, the memories they have. But they don't need a three-bedroom anymore. So if you can make it so people on a fixed income can move into something, like, you know, give up that rent-stabilized apartment, okay? I know the pinnacle isn't a rental building, but for the sake of argument. <laughs> you can give up your rent stabilized apartment and move into you know a one bedroom that's specifically for seniors that's for veterans that's for things like that and you could still be in the same neighborhood not too far your friends are still accessible the park you love is still accessible we can make a real difference and then families younger families can access those larger apartments that these people just don't want to give up again same scenario that mitchell law apartment is a two bedroom and it could fit a family of four, but right now there's only one person living there of, of my relatives left. My mother's uh, cousin lives there. So it's kind of ironic that she has a two bedroom to herself and people are dying, being down the walls for a two bedroom, Mitchell Lama. That doesn't seem logical, but, uh, well, you know. The thing it, is, it, like, like, like that grandma, she, if she were to try to go find a one bedroom apartment, they're going to charge her a ridiculous amount of money if these programs that you speak of don't exist. So what um, motivation or, or incentive does she have to, I'm going to stay here. I'm paying a low price, you know, and why would I, why would I move? You know, I mean, um, it's 53, the rent's $600. I'm not getting yeah, out of here. Why would I, I'm not going nowhere, you know, and, and I understand that. I, I do the same damn thing. I had one of my friends who had one of those apartments and he was giving it up. I was like, dude, are you crazy? Don't do that. He's like, nah, I'm, I'm moving. He moved to Oklahoma. And uh, I was like, are you out of your mind? And, you know, I was like, rent that joint on the low, bro. Like, you know, we're, we're so, you know, you know, I mean, you know, oh and of course, God. oh, we're not condoning any form of uh, <laughs> illegal behavior whatsoever. You know, I'm just saying that, uh, that you don't want to give it up. And he gave it up. And to me, that, that was like, whoa, you know, like, and he was in an amazing neighborhood that would cost ridiculous amounts of money to get an apartment you know so you you're you know your point is is good you know you have a three bedroom apartment one person but you give them no incentive to leave you're not helping them why would they leave their three bedroom to move into a one bedroom and pay more more right. than likely if they're paying market value or whatever you know and have no protection of uh, over ridiculous rent increases and stuff like it, it doesn't make sense so that would be, you know, um, definitely a, a good thing to do. Um, you mentioned the veterans, the elderly. I mean, yeah, I know a guy um, in Queens College. And again, I won't use his name because to protect his privacy, but he's a great guy. He's in the Marines. He served his country faithfully. Um, and, you know, nice, nice guy. And he's got he's got three kids living in Briarwood. And it's it's tough. It's tough. It's really, it's really, really difficult. Um, he's someone who could benefit from something like that. You know, a lot of families could benefit from something like that. Um, well, and these people are, are, are serving the nation. You know, I'm a veteran myself, right? And I am. Really? Thank you for your service. Oh. <laughs> you know, I'm uh, lucky that I was never deployed into a combat zone, right? I'm, I'm, I don't know if well, lucky is the right word to use. I, I. I guess fortunate. I, I don't know. I don't know what word to use. That isn't. I didn't deploy to combat, so I didn't suffer any physical or mental um, wounds or injuries. You know, um, in in a combat environment, right? So I I am a veteran. I served, but I don't feel justified in saying, well, you know, I want one of those apartments when there's a guy who may have gotten injured, um, sure. be it in you know in the, in the mind, in the body, that mm -hmm. is has a harder time than I do, I would want personally to make sure that they're taken care of, True. you know? Yeah. So, you know, when you're referencing veterans, um, I don't think of it like for people like me, right. you know, I think of it like, yeah, I'm a veteran. I served great. You know, I did my duty, but there's that gentleman who suffered that brain injury because something exploded next to him. 
and he has a hard time holding down a job. He has a hard time being in a society. Right. That individual really needs that. Absolutely. You know, this is the people we want to take care of, you know, and to take that money and put it into these nonsense things when we should be helping the people who give us these protect us and it just blows yeah. my mind it doesn't follow logically no it doesn't and it's with a disservice to those who serve um we, we forget the vets a lot in the country and we we take our freedoms for granted um we do and thank you again i'm sure you get banged all the time but thank you for your service well, thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> i always yeah i always feel weird with that because again i i you know i it, it was you know, if you if you break it down, it was like a job. I went to a job and I did a job. We never were um, in a, you know, like I never got deployed into an active combat zone. So I feel like I'm, it, I, I don't want to say stolen valor, but the, the, the thanks that I give to those guys is yeah. because of their actual physical and mental sacrifice, you know? Yeah. 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 I always feel weird, you know, when, when, with that, but I, I, the fact of the matter is I did put on the uniform and I was ready, you know, I was there ready. And sometimes things don't happen and that's fine, but I was ready and willing, you know, so Absolutely. You know, well, thank you for that too. <laughs> you know? Well, anyway, round circle again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that the dirty, if you're going to build a dirty story building, it should be for affordable housing for long time residents, seniors, the vets, the disabled, you know, if you can find the money to jail people, you can find the money to help people. And I, I believe that very profoundly. Um, you know, it, it's people don't need a hand up, but they need a hand. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's really what we give them. If we can give them affordable housing, there's people like my, again, my, my friend who's uh, in the Marines, you know, He's a hardworking guy. He has a job. He just, the housing costs are what kills him. Okay. Right. With, with uh, you know, a family of five, the housing costs. Yeah, it's it. tough. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. So um, there's um, policing. You, you spoke about community-based policing, um, people knowing the police officers, right? Which... I think that's that's a phenomenal idea, and I've I've always advocated for that. And I see the difficulty of something like that in a big city like New York, as opposed to a small town. But it does make sense that if you know the officers and you have a relationship, the dynamic changes. If you're from the neighborhood, you lived in the neighborhood, you're you're a, a resident of the neighborhood, the dynamic changes. You know, those are really great ideas, which also tie into like things like Black Lives Matter. If we all know each other and we're all friends, you know, maybe uh, there I'm called to a conflict and I say I'm, I'm an officer. I'm not an officer because, I mean, if we go into all the problems, it's, it's just nuts, right? Like one of the things I think is if you're a fearful person, you shouldn't be an officer. Now, if I mention all my childhood trauma from the gang violence and all those things, they make me an anxious person. Right. You know, they make me nervous. If I if I am rolling up to a, and I see a group of people, I get nervous. So I know that I'm not a good candidate for being an officer, because I'm gonna alpha up. Hi. You know, exactly. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be fearful and I'm gonna reach for that weapon because I'm scared. You know, so I oh. know that I am not a good candidate for that type of stressful job. So we know it's a tough job. We know it's rough. But if you're friends with the people and you know them, look at Officer Tommy Norman. I don't know if you ever seen his his uh, videos. This 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 guy, he's um I think in Arkansas, and he is loved by the community. They love him. He helps everyone. He knows the kids. He goes and visits them. The true meaning of community policing. Okay. This guy, you know. So I don't know how we do that in a place like New York. But what you mentioned, uh, I, I believe I read was. You have some people that live in the area should be policing the area. Absolutely. I believe that, uh, well, first off, from a financial perspective, it makes no sense that officers live outside New York City. First, in an event of an emergency, I don't need someone driving in from Riverhead, 
okay? If we have another September 11th, God forbid, okay? I don't need an officer drive, and it's, it's all hands on deck. I don't need a guy driving on the LIE for two hours from Riverhead, okay, to get to downtown Manhattan. That's not a good idea, first off. Number two, from, from a financial perspective, it makes no sense that we're subsidizing all these communities around New York, okay, and not the city itself. Cops get paid good money, okay, um, and their investments should go back into the city of New York, not outlying areas. A lot of city employees, including my wife, again, teacher, uh, is requ they're required to live within the city. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's very, very shocking that, uh, that they don't. So right now it's actually the, a slight majority of people. I think it's slightly above 50% live outside the city of New York. So the majority of officers don't even live in New York. Um, uh, I think it's like 50.1 or 50.2, something like that. Live in the outlying suburbs of Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, Putnam, Dutchess, Rockland, or Orange. Um, so that's, that seems a little preposterous to me. Now, I, we can't ask people to sell their, their houses and move back into the city, mm -hmm. but we should certainly make it a requirement for new officers that, like, look, if you're going exactly. to be right. here. Go, going forward or hiring and, yeah. you know, that, that's one of the, the, the you know, stipulate, and even if it's, if it's just a percentage, because, you know, you, you don't know the, you don't know the ways, you don't know the culture, you don't know the people, you don't know the, you know, these things matter. It really yeah. matters in how you interact with someone if you have a vested interest in the community. Right. If that's right. where you're from, if, you know, uh, I mean, if I were policing my old neighborhood, you know, the first thing I do is meet all the kids. Right. You know, make, make sure I know them and watch them and help them and guide them and try to, you know, it, it's not like that. I don't, I don't think I ever met any one officer that I formed a relationship with or a friendship with or anything there was one cop that i saw more than once and i recognized him when i was a kid because he he almost arrested me he caught me in the, you know he caught me in the middle of a big gang fight and um this guy was uh very racist he said some really nasty things about me and my friends and um his mindset was uh we're gonna let you guys fight and whoever wins we're gonna arrest you that's what the guy said oh, to me. really that was his mindset. So yeah. I saw, yeah. So I remember his face and I saw him years later as an, as a, when I was in college and um, I, I, you know, I was wearing a button down shirt. I had a tie on and he saw me in the train and he recognized me cause he had roughed me up. You know, he knew, he knew who I was and I knew who he was and we looked at each other and he kind of nodded at me. That was the closest, <laughs> you know, that was the closest to a relationship I had with an officer at that time from my childhood was him looking at me, him recognizing me. And he goes, <laughs> you know, That's like it. he, he nods, like saying, okay, you cleaned it up. The you know, cause, cause yeah, you cleaned it up. That was the, job, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or you're, you know what, maybe you're not some, you know, <laughs> yeah, you, know, know. Okay. you know, you're not one of, you know, like, I don't even want to say the word he called me, but, um, oh my God. I can only imagine <laughs> yeah. the Latino word that, that is used for, derogatory <laughs> expression <laughs> of uh, disdain or whatever. But, you know, that, that was the closest as opposed to if you, when you get a chance, you know, after, after we're done talking, look up Officer Tommy Norman and you'll see how people love this guy, how much he does for the community. The guy is, uh, he's a prime example of, of uh, you know, like, like, like um, just what community policing really is, you know. Um, I mean, he helps people. Um, he he's very popular on uh, like uh, uh, Instagram, and he's become popular through his acts and his action. And he uses that to get people from all over the United States to donate things to people in his community. People wow. send send. There's there's he's right now trying to get a king size bed for a for a woman and her her wow. family and her children, and wow. and somebody donated the the frame to them now. You know what I mean? Like, this is like, he goes, he knocks on the door. Hey, how are you doing? I'm so, so do you guys need anything? And some, this lady said, I, you know, I could really use a, a, a bed. Wow. And he says, he's recording this on social media. He's got over a million followers and people help. Yeah. And, and he, he has, it's almost like an operation of things arriving, 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 arriving <laughs> for the, for, oh, this is for Amaya. 
you know, um, things uh, arriving and he drives and takes them the things that they need, the things for school, a bed. I mean, it's unbelievable. It almost moves me to tears when I watch what well, has it many uh, times moved me to tears watching the things that this guy does. And I think to myself, it's a small, it's a town, you know, it's not like a city, but right. we can, we can do they something. Know each other. They have a relationship. That's, that's, that makes a difference. It makes such a difference. Huge difference. If we can, you know, if like like the officer you spoke to, you approached her, um, Officer Torres. Officer Torres, right? right? You know, I see her now more often, and I talk to her. How you doing? If if we had that, where we know the officers and the kids know the officers, there's no need to fear them. Right. But growing up, whenever I saw cops, my instinct was, oh, you know, I'm about to get slammed up on a wall. Or, you know, I better dip and get upstairs so I don't get pulled into whatever is happening. Right. Like, this but is what we know talk. you. Hey, how's it going, Officer Torres? How you doing? They're like, they'll, they know, like, who they're dealing with, right? Yeah, and you know. They, there's a... Uh, there's how do we accomplish that? There. You know, like, like, that's the thing. How do we do that in a place like New York, which is so big? And, you know, it, it, it can't not be done. I feel like it, there's got to be a way. You, you set up... A, perimeters and the officer is going to be responsible for this area right. i'm sure it could be done absolutely i think that if it can be done in a small city like camden new jersey uh where it's been employed for several years now and it's tremendously successful um i think it can be done here i think it can be done here. and it actually leads to reduction in crime because people who are afraid to go to the police now trust the police more and can help right. solve crimes it's actually a good thing. It makes the cops' jobs easier, ultimately. People don't want to do it because they fall into habit patterns and they're patterns that are hard to break. But, uh, you know, it really would be a boon to the community. I made the argument, you remember maybe a few years ago, there was a shooting, I think it was um, like in Florida, somewhere like right above Miami, um, where there was an autistic person who had escaped from a mental home and he had like a silver truck or something in his hand. And basically, the cops started with a gun, and they were, they he was not responding to their commands to drop it because he's autistic. Mm. He escaped from a um, a, a group home or something like that. And so the the social worker, uh, the, the 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 dude that was on the floor with him, yeah, he was laying lame. flat, and they shot they shot at him. <laughs> okay, unbelievable. If you knew your community. Okay, and you recognize, oh, there's that kid who always sits in front of uh, the building on Clark. You know, what? he's autistic. Oh, and that's the social worker. He probably he's, he's... are threatened because we know him. We know yeah. he's autistic. We've seen him 50 times because we walk the beat every day. Okay, no shots would be fired. <laughs> they could not like just walk over to him. There's not, he doesn't pose a threat. He's not going to be able to fire, aim a gun and shoot you. Or, okay? or a silver toy truck. <laughs> yeah, precisely, yeah. precisely. Yeah. So no, no, there are inherent benefits. It actually leads to better safety for both officers and for community, and actually lowest crime. Um, you know, that's, that's what you need, honestly. Um, you, you, need, you need to, and look, that, that's the problem, too, is that people get, um, on, on the opposite side of the political spectrum, people get too hung up on the linguistics. Black, li all, black lives matter. All, all lives matter. Of course all lives matter. That's not what they're saying. Right. They're saying black lives also matter because we've been shot a lot of times, and right. there seems to be an inherent inequity. It, it seems to be unfair. This this is disparity between, and people argue that this is not the case, and they pull out stats, and uh, you know, I, 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 I am not a statistician. I, I sucked the stats. I passed it. I got an A when I took it in school, but I also had a girlfriend who was a math major who may or may not have helped me, right? And um, I was very good at memorizing formulas. So when I tested, I memorized them and I regurgitated it and done. But I'm not a stats guy. I can only speak about what I see with my eyes. I'm um, going back to those childhood stories. I was involved with these events that were less than savory with my friends. And you see how I look, I'm Latino, but you see how I look. 
there's a certain degree of privilege that I am afforded because of how I look. And mm -hmm. I was treated differently than some of my friends were. The level of aggression, the level of, of consequence for the same acts was wow. different. So it is very difficult for, for, for me to, to say, no, this privilege isn't real. I, you know, no, 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 I have seen it, wow. you know? So I don't walk the streets of, of particularly afraid of cops. Right. Because they don't bother me. Right. You know, um, they did when I was younger, um, but it was more than likely because of the neighborhood I was in. But then again, that reinforces how we're treating people in different neighborhoods differently. You right? group everyone together. You know, so that that's something that should be looked at. But even then, like that cop I told you that that nodded at me, he just gave me a ticket. He didn't he didn't he didn't put cuffs on me. Right. He didn't take me down to the pre he just gave me a ticket. Get out of here, kid. Wow. You know, where had he caught maybe one of my other friends, it could have been different. Mm -hmm. We don't know, you know. Um there's an inherent bias in everyone, okay? And everyone can say that like I don't I don't have that, that's not how I think, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's always a slight twang of prejudice. And again, because the human mind tries to sort out people and sort out patterns. There's an inherent bias that, that comes with that. And you might not even, be, it may be so subtle that, that it's basically negligible, but you wouldn't be aware of it in, in any circumstance. Um, you just wouldn't well, you, be aware you, of it. You mention it to people and they think that you're, you know, you're, oh, you're just a, you're just a liberal, you're, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, you know, the liberalism is a mental disorder. You don't know what you're talking about. And, and it's like, well, you know, I, 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 I can only talk about the things I have seen. Mm -hmm. And I have seen the way I was treated in contrast to friends of mine. I see, you know, I, I just see the dynamic is different in the world. So I acknowledge that. And if I can, if everybody just acknowledged that, maybe we could make things better. And, and I, you know, I, I feel that maybe the fear is just that in acknowledging it, you give it up. Right. Well, right. then you no longer have that. And now you're, you know, so what does that mean? Who's that? Damn, I can't remember her name. But this woman, um, oh, man, I'm, I'm drawing all kinds of blanks on because <laughs> I read, I read so much and stuff, but there's a woman and she said, um, in a room full of white people, she said, would you be comfortable being treated the same as a black person? Would you be comfortable if society treated you the same way they treat black people? Mm -hmm. She posed this question. She said, if you're okay with that, stand up. No one stood up. She says, so therein you know that society treats you different mm -hmm. because you didn't stand up. And, and I, I, I was like, you know, just mind blown with that. And, and since then, I did a lot of research on her and reading on her. I can't believe I'm drawing a blank on her name. And, you know, but uh, it, it, it's easy to find with that quote. Um, it's, it's something that, that if you're from the same community, maybe that, that isn't as prevalent. You know? you know, Angel, it's funny that you, because you, you just reminded me of a, a book that I read when I was younger. Have you ever heard of John Howard Griffin? Uh, it doesn't ring a particularly loud bell, but it does a little ping. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when, I, when I was younger, I happened upon it. I used to be a very, very avid reader. I still read, but mostly newspapers and, and magazines nowadays. But mm. there used to be a very prominent uh at least in my mind, author, his name is John Howard Griffin, and he wrote a book called Black Like Me. Um, so he, I don't know how they were able to accomplish this, but basically he took, um, he went to a dermatologist, he's a, a white individual, he went to a dermatologist and he took drugs to um, ex basically create a lot of uh, buildup of uh, melanin in the skin. Is it melanin that I'm thinking of? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so he took a bunch of drugs and he sat under a tanning lamp for a couple of weeks straight. Um, and then he shaved his head so you couldn't see his hair. And he passed in society as 
uh, an African American. Um, and he was shocked to find the difference in the way he was treated uh, when he was actually masquerading as a uh, black individual, as opposed to his normal everyday life. Now, this is written in the 60s. So <laughs> when right, he right. got down south, things were not great for him. <laughs> um, but it really is a fascinating, fascinating read. Um, you know, it, it's not long the book, and I really recommend it to all your listeners. But uh, that, that really was an eye-opener for me personally to see the difference. And then after a while, you know, he basically, he, if you didn't, if you stayed inside for a while, you know, basically, and you didn't get any sun exposure, your skin started to return to normal. So as he got lighter, he could apply cold cream to his face and kind of lighten himself up, a little bit of pancake, and he would come back to the same hotel, mm. okay, and see how he was treated then, or see how people treated him. And every time, he, he, was, uh, he was surprised to see people in Heron Bises. Black Like Me is the book, and John Howard Griffin is the author. But it was very, very interesting read. Um, and uh, I wonder if like, people really got the opportunity to really walk a mile in other people's shoes, what they would really think, um, mm. even just for a day, uh, you know, because it, it, it would shock them, I, would feel, I think. Um, but hey, you know, I, I also it's... recommend you do that because you'll probably get skin cancer. But, you know, yeah. it would be very interesting to see, like, if that experiment were reperformed today, like, um, well, what, what, what would you see? It you wouldn't know, be I as think... intense as back then, but you would definitely see something, I feel. Oh, yeah, for sure. But then, and also there's the flip side, though. They're going to, um, at that point now, is this guy doing blackface? You know, so it's like, you know, that probably wouldn't. Uh, fly today, you know, you know, yeah, I, yeah. you know, because even though I can see the intent, I think that um, you know, and by today's standards and the way we we have evolved um, okay. as people, that that probably would not, you know, be well received. But it is certainly something that if people experienced and really knew that they would, you know, even even just growing up where I grew up, it's a different world. Oh yeah, you know, no, it's even different times nowadays, it's different times. You know, even even like I, the way I look, the 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 way I was treated and perceived just because I lived in that area was different. You know, it was very different back then. I had shorter hair. Why? Well, I've always had shorter hair. You know, I, I'm just experimenting now, growing it. But <laughs> I always had shorter hair since I had my eyebrows slashed. The, the society treated me differently. Wow. But I, I and and that's looking the way I look. And imagine if I look different. You know, so acknowledging these things, I. I think it's the first step and a lot of people just they don't want to they don't believe that there's a problem right. you know and that's 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 the issue you know people have inherent biases everywhere too and it, it's not unique to any location it, it's it's found everywhere in the world when I was younger um, my mother's cousins uh, in Puerto Rico they lived in San Juan um, my cousin Jane had blonde hair and blue eyes, and she lived in San Juan. And you know, my mother and my and her siblings and my grandparents would all fly down every year or so to Puerto Rico, so my grandmother could see her sister, my great aunt, and and everybody could be together again. Um, she married a, a Puerto Rican doctor, and she moved down and to San Juan. Statehood's right around the corner, honey. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that worked well. And yeah. uh, um, but uh, so they so she she would go down there and, and see everybody. But so basically they were in um my mother and and my cousin Jane and her cousin Jane, my one first cousin once removed, um, were in a cafe when they were younger, just chatting along. And uh, the, the people behind them just assumed because my mother and her were conversing in English. That you know they couldn't understand them, and they said, "Oh, you know, Latin gringos." Gringos, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so my cousin Jane turned. I wouldn't fly in my family. My cousin Jane turned around and in perfect Spanish told them off pretty bad. And uh, my, my mother can step along in Spanish pretty well. And she was just like, "See," and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, but it's, it's funny. You know, I mean, biases, like, 
my family are in Puerto Rican as they come. Actually, my mother, her cousin Jane's brother, I shouldn't use names, but that's okay. You can use certain. That's my family. <laughs> but um, my cousin Jane's brother was actually um, eventually the Secretary of Health for Puerto Rico. Um, oh. So he's uh, Johnny William Rihorczyk was his name, Polish, you know, oh. and Puerto Rico. So you, you need combination there. But, you know, he, he served Puerto Rico very well. They loved him when he passed away. It was very, very tragic, both for us and for the whole island. Um, but, you know, it, it's people have these preconceived notions about other people, and it, it's just not there because obviously everyone's an individual, um, right. you know. And maybe one day we'll live in a society where that's minimal. I don't think it'll be 100% gone. But maybe there'll be a society where it is very, very minimal. I think in New York, more so than other places, mm. nowadays, like, growing up, I, I didn't see that, like, you know, people were really different for me, um, you know. And, and growing up, you know, my uncle married a, a woman who's, you know, part Spanish, part Chinese. I have another uncle married to a woman who's half Greek, half Puerto Rican. It didn't really matter. They were just people and they got married and they were happy. That's all that really mattered. So I really didn't feel like that was a problem in my family. My wife is from Nigeria, actually. Um, so it, that wasn't really a thing for me growing up. We didn't really talk about that. I mean, it, was just, it wasn't really uh, an issue <laughs> for us uh, like some people had. And I, I don't see why it should be an issue. You just, you want to hang out with the people you want to hang out with and be with the people you want to be with. It doesn't matter what their background is or even what they eat. It's whether they're nice or whether they're mean. Um, everything I know, I learned in kindergarten, right? So. And those are, the, those are the important lessons right there. So People's views evolve. What I feel today might not be right. the way I felt 10 years ago or might not be the same way I, I felt 10 days ago. People evolve, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, you know, if we can acknowledge that, and that's a good thing, you know, um, I, if you read my writing from, I don't know, uh, I don't know how many years, maybe 10 years, maybe eight, 10, 18 years ago, when I was writing for right wing publications, because I had a right wing period, like, a, and it was primarily due to wanting to protect my gun rights, you know, so wow. I had a right wing period, because I just wanted to protect my gun rights. And I did a lot of writing for publications. If you've read that stuff, you probably wouldn't talk to me. You know, you would be like, oh, hell no. You know, because it's, it's the views back then were much more harsh than they are now where I've, you know, because my political life was Democrat, Republican, Independent, Democrat. Okay. You know, um, because I couldn't vote in primaries, you know, wow. so I had to go re-enroll in, in the party. Um, but that right wing period, even then, get this, I voted for Obama both times. Well, there you go. Even though I was registered as a right winger, I still, it was just because I didn't want to lose my gun rights. Right. On, on, on a lot of the social stuff, I still, I was at odds with them. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. What do you mean send them back? Now send them back. All the dreamers got to go. I'm like, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> what do you mean? I what do you know mean? That. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we were at, at odds and I had a lot of, um, you know, sometimes people would say, why do you have that guy on your, on your platform? Like he's, he's not, he's not a, a conservative. He's like, well, you know, he is on some things. He's like, yeah, but on these very key issues, he's not. And so, that's where it becomes a little crazy because then it's like, okay, this person's not passing the litmus test. So he can't be in our special club. And it happens in both parties. Okay. Of course, I'm the guy campaigning. Yeah, I, just, I just mentioned guns. You know, yeah. if I talk about this on, 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 on any of my social, people lose their minds. Yeah. You know? oh, please. I met a guy campaigning just like you. And he goes like, listen, I consider myself to be a conservative Democrat. You know, my wife's Spanish, I, you know, I, I or Hispanic. And, and you know, I, I'm not a racist at all. But, you know, I, I feel like I should be able to go and shoot a few rounds off if I want to. Okay. And, you know, we got into a conversation. We talked about the, um, the gun place on, uh, in Woodhaven underneath the, uh, the J train. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we, it's so funny. And I, I'm like most New Yorkers, I fired a gun and I thought it was fun. 
And, mm -hmm. but you know, look, and it's different for different parts of the country. If you right. live in rural Georgia, okay, and the sheriff's station is an hour away, exactly. okay, and someone breaks exactly. in in the middle of the night, if you have that Smith & Wesson next year, you feel a little bit better, exactly. okay? Exactly. Uh, exactly. So, fair, you know, fair enough. You know, whereas in New York, it's a little different. Of course. You know, we don't want everybody carrying concealed in New York in the train when you get bumped. Right. You know, or when that guy mean mugs you when you're trying to walk through the sidewalk. Exactly. <laughs> you know? So you know? that's where, like, you know, when these groups say, let's abolish the police, I, I say, so what's the alternative? Everyone carries right. guns? Because that's really... You, you're talking about uh, something that abolish. I, I said, what's the language? What, wait a minute. What are you saying? Abolish. They're like abolish the police. I'm like, well, what does that mean? No more cops. You know who's going to be safe if there's no more cops? Me, because I got the 12 gauge. <laughs> you, know, you know, who else is going to be safe? No one else. You know, I mean, only the people that can defend their, themselves. Because the the reality of it is we're not capable of policing ourselves. We, right. I, I am not confident enough in humanity at least at its current stage of evolution to believe that we don't need law enforcement especially right. in new york of course. this place we need it there are things that need to be addressed right that that's that ex and then right. the arguments that i have with people over this is crazy because they say well so you're saying blue lives matter i'm like hold up see you're twisting my words I, I'm saying your neighbor or your cousin. Do you change your opinion then? I mean, it's so ridiculous. Uh, you know, we're just we're just people that have to coexist. We are not good enough as a society to not need police. I'm sorry, we're not. No, I'm t no. I, I just told you I can't walk down the street without five guys wanting to jump me because I walked on the sidewalk. Right. I you know. Okay. What if you're a 90-year-old woman who, can, who can't walk that well and she has to go that way? Right. What, are you, you know, what if they push her? Right? I mean, groceries. you know. You, At the protest, I, actually, there was um, an 85-year-old woman, actually, who, who had walked over, believe it or not. I know you got there a little late, but at the protest of the Umbrella Hotel, there was a woman there, and, and she basically conveyed, you know, I don't feel safe. And what do you do for her? I mean, right. should we give her? Uh, here's, here's, you can you can pick it up. Single action. I hope you have good aim. Like, right, um, exactly, right. What you know, that's that's, yeah, that's a great point. Some people can't can't fend for themselves, right. and um, they need you know you need. I, I mean, that's just a fact. We need law enforcement, but let's fix them. Yeah, let's you know. Let let's. Why and why the, the problem is too is like you're hurting. Look, I I, my, I have a uh, brother-in-law who's a police officer. And I actually uh, just attended his wedding recently, um, and and it's like okay, so he's been a, he's a detective. Um, I think with the drug division. I won't say his name again. Of course, of course. Um, but uh, but you know what? It, it's like why demoralize the people who work really hard. Okay, who try to do their best. Why are you demonizing the good people along with the bad people? Why can't we just have a system where the, the bad, we reward the good cops and we, we punish the bad cops? That is that system so crazy? I mean, if you look at, what was his name? Officer Pantoliano, who yes, uh, yes. strangled um, uh, Gardner back in 14. I mean, that guy continued to get paid for the next five years. Did he sue for his job and win? I thought he sued and won for the. What the hell? Benevolent Association was behind this guy 100. percent Like why? Okay, you're. I understand you got to protect all your dues-paying members. I get that, but come on. I mean, isn't there a common at some point some common sense here? The same PBA who endorsed Trump, by the way. Uh, yeah, okay. that's something else. That because really I would make the argument that Trump has created more chaos and actually increased the chance of crime rather than calming people down, okay? That, that, <laughs> that, yeah. that, so he's not on top side. He's created more problems. Instead yeah. of calming people down and saying, look, this is a serious issue. We've got to look into it. I, I hear you. Yeah, and no. by ignoring that, you I cause can't. more protests, yeah. more problems, more shootings. Are, 
Yeah, they you can't. Cause more problems for the police. Okay. They can't. Uh, that. No, they, I, I think the, the the fears that that people have is that if they condemn someone, then they lose that protection themselves, which they might need. But the thing is that if you're doing the right thing, for the most part, you know we're, we're gonna side with you. Right. I mean, society and everyone is going to side with you. So if we're all doing the right thing, we're all going to side with each other. If we all side against the one bad apple, then we'll see, okay, we're all in this together. Right. You know, but right now it's not like that. It's, well, we got to side with him, even though I think what he did was wrong, but right. I got to back him up because if I don't back him up, who's going to back me up? Right. And that's the unfortunate thing that, that creates the, the sides and the division, you know? Um, Absolutely. The most objectionable thing is that uh, that uh, in my opinion is that when they're wrong they refuse to even admit a slight twang of, uh, of human culpability like we made a mistake we're really sorry when the chief of departments on the NYPD kneeled down with the protesters that was actually a very that gave me hope right. you know to show, like, look, you know, I we all recognize what happened there was wrong. You know, that was a really big moment. And that, it was so satisfying to just hear for once, we're not perfect, and mistakes were made, okay? That's, you know, how much of this, the, uh, just, just recognizing that, okay, is the first step to making a difference. And some, and it doesn't cost any money. He didn't get paid to kneel down. He really felt that what what happened there was wrong, and he said, "You know what? I I agree." And a lot of cops around the country. Agree I, I was going to say that. Wrong. Yeah, I was going to say that. I saw quite a few. For the first time, I actually saw quite a few police officers going on TikTok, going on Facebook, on Twitter, and saying, "You know, that we don't. We're not trained to do that. Right. We're not trained to do that. That guy is wrong." And, uh, you know, seeing that was like, okay, good. Finally, someone, you know, uh, is, is acknowledging it because that's key. That's yeah. key. I, I mean, how else could you make change if you don't acknowledge, you know, if I refuse to acknowledge that I, my appearance grants me some privilege, then how can I then acknowledge that someone else's appearance makes them a target, right. you know, to, to certain things from, from in society in general. Wow. Just, you know, and, and, and I don't feel threatened that by me saying it makes me into any more danger. It's just what it, it is, you know? Honestly, it, it's, it's perception. And we all have some culpability and some kind of guilt, yeah. honestly. Yeah, oh. I, 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 I acknowledge that, you know, like I, I know I have my biases and I have my history, you know? Somebody asked me, Angel, if you were the victim of a uh, crime from black people would you still say black lives matter i said are you kidding me you know how many black dudes beat me up when i was growing up robbed me jumped me you know because they thought i was white yeah. i mean i am the perfect poster boy of someone who should be out there saying white power because uh -huh. because of my experiences i got the crap beat out of me man like unbelievably but I still say Black Lives Matter. Why? Because that individual who beat me up doesn't represent everyone who's black. Of course. And, and the same thing with Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans beat the crap out of me too because I look white, because okay. I went to school, because I was acting white. You know, so if, if there is a person who was susceptible to that radical way of thinking, of hating people because of experiences, that would have been me. And I, I don't. That. I love that they beat you up for acting white. What did that require? Years of training? You had to get a script there? What was, what was that? Did you have to join the drama club to act white? Or how did that I, I spoke English when I was in certain settings, as such as school. I spoke proper English in the street. I spoke slang. Yo, what's up, my G? What, you know, I spoke slang and I spoke proper in certain locations. But whenever I spoke what we call proper, I was acting white, you know, because I went to school, I was acting white. So that element, those individuals, I don't like them. I don't like them. And I, I, I say I don't like them because those individuals, but that's the key. That's the key. 
that guy who did that to me, not every black person. So when that person said that to me, they said, would you still say black lives matter if you were the victim of them? Wait till you, wait till you're the victim, wait till they get you. And I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? Do you know where I grew up? Yeah, you know where I come honestly. from? You know, I was, me too, honestly. It's... but, but that does, you don't go and attack an entire, if, if that were the case, I'd hate all Puerto Ricans. I'd consider myself Dominican because the Dominican dudes never bothered me. <laughs> you know, I, I'd be I'd be calling myself Dominican, Dominican power. You know, oh, um, because they never bothered me. The Puerto Ricans and the black guys were the ones I'm talking about. Beat my butt because of the way I looked, the way I dressed. You know, but I never held it against an entire race of people or entire group of people. You know, that doesn't make sense. So I, I had to tell that person that, and they were like, you know, they were just kind of like confused because they didn't know how to respond, you know? So Evan, um, I've, I've had you on here quite a long time. So is there anything you'd like to, you know, you want to say in closing, anything that you want to um, share for folks, how they can contact you, how they can, you know, please have at it. Uh, absolutely. Um, and thank you for having me on, Angel. It's been a real pleasure. And yeah, I, yeah. They, uh, they, I was a little anxious. I was a little anxious because like, we just met. So I was like, yeah. I, you know, I don't know how to, I don't know what, what should we talk about. So I was a little nervous. I'm, I'm comfortable, you know, so hope yeah. you feel the same. Yeah. Vice versa. You're a good guy. I, I tell you, I really enjoyed our time here. Now. Um, so thank you again. But if anyone wants to uh, get more information about my campaign, uh, they can go to Bacardi for city council, uh, dot com. It's B O C C A R D I, uh, for city council, one word, dot com. And, you know, you can just go on the website there. We, you know, we take anyone's opinions. We take anyone's ideas. We're, we're happy to listen to it. We occasionally have, uh, like web fireside chats that people can log on and just as a community get together and then discuss what they need discuss things they want to see done in their neighborhoods. You know, people have a lot of creative solutions and I've been amazed campaigning so far, the great ideas that people have. So I would love, I, as a politician, like everyone else, I work for you. It's not the other way around. And that's the way I feel it's been for a long time in our community and that's why I'm running. So, you know, mm -hmm. time to make sure everybody has their say again. Right, as it should be, and it isn't. It isn't. Well, we wish you good luck on the campaign, and Thank hope you, you do well. And, and I appreciate you uh, introducing yourself at that event. Thank you for being there as well. And um, you know, best of luck, and I hope to talk to you soon. And and um, quite possibly, you know, when you're sitting in a council chair. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you can have my. You can come over anytime. Awesome. I'll make the tough done it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God. We are NYC Talking, the realest lifestyle blog ever. Please like NYC Talking on Facebook. Please follow Angel R Talk on Twitter and Instagram. www.nyctalking.com. Thanks for listening.